Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Hunt Science Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Lance, a professionally certified wildlife biologist and natural resource professional, college professor, and owner of Land Source Consulting. The Hunt Science Podcast is dedicated to bring you the latest information on popular habitat management topics, wildlife science, hunting strategies, and the general conservation and land management practices to help preserve our natural resources. Thank you for joining us today. We are excited to have you with us and hope that you enjoy today's episode. With that said, let's get started. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by our primary sponsor, Landsource Consulting. Landsource Consulting is an Ohio-based wildlife and land management consulting company that I own and operate not only here in Ohio, but through the Midwest and beyond. At LandSource, we work with private landowners just like you to build and develop those property-specific management programs to help bring the goals that you have on your property to life. If you're interested in getting more information on who we are and how we can help you, please visit us over at LandSourceConsulting.com. There you can check out the different service packages and capabilities that we can provide. We would love to hear from you, so don't hesitate to reach out to us and schedule that free consultation either through our website or you can reach out to us and connect with us on our other social media platforms such as Facebook and Instagram. That's LandSourceConsulting.com, building relationships for a more sustainable future. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Hunt Science Podcast. This week, I am joined by Dr. Joe Spoo, the gun doc vet. How you doing today, sir? Doing good. That, that That's awesome. Yeah, so um, like we were talking a little bit off air, really appreciate you spending time um, to come on and talk with me. You know, I know the life of a veterinarian is is massively hectic and, and busy. Um, so finding someone to focus on, you know, this being a hunting podcast, basically, almost every hunter has a dog or has a hunting dog or something like that. So I figured when I did this, I really wanted to focus on um, and do some, some episodes on not only dog training with friends of mine that have kennels and do training, but also on the veterinary side as well, because I think there's a lot of, you know, misconceptions out there. I think there's a lot of generalities out there and, you know, you being board certified in this field, um, you know, would be a good conversation to kind of get some things and good information out there. So thank you. You bet. Okay. So, excuse me. So why don't we start off on who you are, you know, where you grew up and, you know, what kind of led you down the path of being a veterinarian and particularly working with the sporting breeds? Sure. So I I grew up in Northwest Iowa. So the, the kind of the Southern tip of the prairie pothole region and, uh, um, started pre CR, uh, CRP days. So a lot of croplands, a lot of, of, uh, uh, prairie potholes. Uh, my first early, early memories are in the front of a duck boat. So long before I ever was in a classroom, my dad had me out duck hunting. And uh, I think that's probably where the love started. So uh, just huge diet in the world, in the wool water fowler. Um, we'd always chase some pheasants. We had at that time early in life had Hungarian partridge as well. Um, then CRP came along, pheasant populations boomed in Northwest Iowa. Huns kind of tailed a little bit down, um, and, and I spent most of my time chasing ducks and then would switch to pheasants once everything kind of froze up, um, you know, and, and migrated through pretty much the only thing I ever wanted to be in life was a veterinarian. Uh, it, it's, you know, early, early memories of, you know, house dogs that we had and stuff like that. Um, mom and dad have newspaper clippings from elementary school of, you know, when, when they interview and ask all the kids, the local kids, what they want to be, it was always veterinarian for me. So never policeman, fireman, race car driver, any of that, it was just always veterinarian. And so that's kind of my whole life has been focused that route. So even, even from high school, uh, you know, it was focused on how do I get into vet school? Uh, went to Iowa state both for undergrad. I did two to two years of undergrad, got into vet school early. And, uh, while I was in Ames, I had the, the, we, we always vacationed in Northern Minnesota growing up. And so, uh, you know, I thought that the North woods, uh, read Gordon McQuarrie's, the old duck hunters books and had visions of going to Northern Minnesota and chasing divers on lakes up there, fishing for walleyes and, and then chasing some rough grouse. Um, once I moved up there, I didn't realize that the, the bait industry had kind of destroyed the wild rice beds and everybody that, that duck hunted where I lived in Minnesota, went further north to like Lake of the Woods and up into Canada, the local duck hunting wasn't great. Um, and so I've spent my time either coming to back home to Northwest Iowa or uh, while I was in vet school, I had met um, some older guys from Sioux Falls, South Dakota on a duck boat building site. 
and they invited me out to duck hunt with them. And so my, I think it was my senior year of vet school, I had scheduled some time off during duck season and went out to South Dakota, Northern South Dakota to hunt with these guys. And clearly it was paradise for a duck hunter. And so when I was in Minnesota, I'd apply for the out of state license. Um, it's a lottery system here in South Dakota. In my second year in Minnesota, I didn't draw. And I said, to heck with this. I'm moving to South Dakota to chase ducks. And so I, I'd figure out the veterinary stuff when I got out here. So I moved to South Dakota um, at the time, had a Chessy and a, an English setter. And I uh, bought the English setter for the grouse woods of Minnesota. It was not her jam. Uh, she was a hard charging, big running dog. Uh, and so coming out here, the prairie birds were ideal for her. And so in addition to duck hunting, I've, I, uh, I chase a lot of prairie chickens and, and sharp tail grouse. So there's kind of my two things out here. And, and while I was here, obviously, um, all through vet school, uh, into practice, hunting dogs were my thing. Um, I started gun dog doc, uh, in the early two thousands, maybe the late nineties, uh, bought the website. Uh, it's had about three or four different iterations. That was kind of my online business card for a consulting business that I started in 2003. And so pretty much since, uh, probably since 2003, I've worked both full-time in industry, full-time in practice. About eight years ago, uh, my wife and I uh, started a practice here in Sioux Falls. She's uh, uh, also a board certified specialist. We're the only two in the region. I dragged her up here from South Florida. So she's a Texas A&M girl that had practiced in Florida convinced her to come to South Dakota. And uh, we kind of built the first uh, hybrid specialty practice here in, in South Dakota. So we saw uh, uh, specialty cases and, and had general practitioners that worked for us as well. And about four years ago, we uh, entered into a partnership with the corporation. And then two years ago, we fully kind of sold out. And so now I focus more on the consulting, uh, still practice uh, a couple of times uh, a week, but have, have kind of scaled back on the practice side, focusing more on um, hunting dogs in the consulting side, uh, doing things like this and, uh, just pursuing my love of the outdoors, chasing my dogs. Yeah, that's awesome. Is your wife board certified in sports medicine as well? She is not. So, um, she's a American board of veterinary practitioners. And so kind of a jack of all trades on the specialty side, especially being here. Okay. So a lot of internal medicine, a lot of oncology, a lot of radiology. So she has advanced training in kind of all those areas. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. You know, when I was getting ready, you know, for vet school, that was, that was the thing too, was, you know, kind of like you, I grew up, I, I, I didn't always want to be a veterinarian, you know, when I was pursuing that track is I just always had an infatuation with wildlife. Sure. You know, and, and when I got into high school, I really fell in love with biology, chemistry, you know, the, the sciences. Yep. I'm like, man, like anatomy and physiology was something that I just was massively um, intrigued by. I was like, how can I kind of combine the two things, you know? And early in my uh, uh, undergrad, I was like, you know, I think I'm going to try this veterinary thing. And I remember it went with old school. You know, I think the guy was like in his 60s, late 60s, you know, early 70s, farm vet, did nothing but horses and cattle. And I just, I fell in love with it. And I was like, this is awesome, you know? But then I was like, man, you know, wanting to work with wildlife and, and you know, decided to go the different route. But yeah, that's, that's awesome because... Uh, you know, I, I think that's a, a lot of people listen to this probably with their kids and stuff. And, and most of the people that are veterinarians, that's the case is, is you know, as an early age and, and being able to, though, to um, go off and specialize with working breeds, you know, was something I really didn't know that that was a, a career path, you know, in sure. the veterinary field. So, you know, until it's, it's you know, relatively years, new. You yeah, know, it's, 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 it's until years specialty. later. Yeah, yeah, that's that's awesome. You know, that that's really cool. It, it fits perfect for what I want to do. So, okay. So we got that. So now we kind of talked on why you, the sporting breeds, right? I think that's why a lot of us love sporting breeds is because, you know, we can take them out in the woods. I'm an avid hunter myself. You know, I hunt, you know, waterfowl up and game birds, deer, you know, you name it. My bird dogs, even though they're bird dogs, they're with me all the time, you know, and I think that's something that's the, that draws people to these breeds, whether it's a Chessy, whether it's a pointer, you know, whether it's a lab, whatever is just the diversity in the, in the situation you can take them into. So, this being a veterinary podcast and I figured we would kind of take this in chronological order and, mm -hmm. and start with the very beginning. Okay. You're, you're interested in getting a sporting breed dog from your perspective as the veterinarian that specializes in this with your clients and things that you've seen, what are 
your what's your advice for the person that's thinking first off on getting a pointer or a chessy or something yep. like that? So, and, and that's so I, I attack sports medicine with a cradle to grave approach in 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 pre cradle. I would say is is where it starts, right? So it's it's a lot of it's the genetics of things, and I think you know it, it's understanding the breed you're choosing and then from there understanding the problems that that breed has and i think that that a lot of people get blindness to that right and so they 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 want to overlook things or they want to go to to the popular kennels and and i think it's it's one that you know doing a lot of research on on the front end is important so all of my dogs that i've bought as puppies um it was probably a one to two year process of putting that deposit down and, and it's having these talks with breeders and understanding their dogs and so you know it's it's one like before i got into the field cockers i i thought you know a boy can seem like a natural fit right because they're they're a waterfowl dog it's that's what they're known for but the more i looked into boykins i got a real small gene pool and you'd call and talk to these breeders and and they'd you know i'd ask about skin issues i'd ask about you know hip problems knee problems and and all of them super healthy dogs right they had no problems and then as a the conversation would go on, they talk about like the special concoctions that they'd have to use for the ears and, and, and without even realizing it, they had problems. They had allergy problems, they had skin problems, they had orthopedic problems, but they didn't see it as such because they had blindness to their kennel. And so I think it's, it's finding out what are the issues within the breed of your choice and then asking those targeted issues to those breeders. And sometimes you have to almost be like an investigative reporter because they may not see it as a problem. Uh, I think we see it right now in the retriever world where there's a, a, a high demand for uh, British dogs. And, and I think that sometimes people are breeding dogs that maybe don't have the health clearances that, or, or to the standard that we should because there's such a high demand. And so asking those questions, you know, do you have dogs with hip dysplasia, with elbow dysplasia? Um, how much are you keeping track of puppies that you're producing? Uh, what, what are you, uh, what are you doing for the health clearances of those dogs? And, and then, and then asking about the specific things. So Chessies in particular, you know, uh, have a condition called degenerative myelopathy, which is the dog equivalent of Lou Gehrig's disease. And so you, know, how's your breeding program with that? Are you only breeding clear dogs, which is also a little bit of a red flag, right? Because we can't eliminate just a carrier dog because then we're going to further bottleneck those genetics. And so it's really starts with, with figuring out what breed you want, what problems they have, and then really interviewing breeders. And I think that breeders kind of fall into two categories, uh, ones that are going to talk your leg off to the point you're like, oh my God, how do I get off the phone? And then two, um, the breeders that say, well, you either want my dog or you don't and, and not take the time of day. Um, I get a real red flag issue with the, the people that won't take the time of day to talk to you. And, and I understand that they probably get sick and tired of tire kickers, but that's kind of the, the path they've chosen. And so finding somebody that you can have these conversations that are going to answer your questions, I think is vitally important. And, and then making those decisions. And so I always tell people there's no guarantee with, uh, with living creatures. And if I was a breeder, I actually wouldn't have a health guarantee and every breeder has health guarantees because I think in some people's minds, it sets up that this puppy should be flawless. And that's not the case with, with these dogs. And so they do have health issues. Um, and, and, and so just making sure that you're putting the odds in your favor that you're, you're buying a healthy dog. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, the health the health guarantees always kind of were red flags for me too a little bit because it's it's like you said, you can't really guarantee. Like I look at my my female pointer, she's 3. We got her from a very respectable, it, you know, again, same thing. You know, I knew what I wanted and and you know, did a lot of research on the dogs and and the the people we got her from were great. They're, you know, very very big and and pointers had great dogs, you know, everything like that. Well, ours got entropian, you know, and and had mm -hmm. that pop up you know, and, and, you know, she got a hold of me instantly and was, yeah, I was like, Hey, it's okay. You know, I mean, you can't, you, you can't account for, you know, it's, it's, right. you know, something that just popped up. I was like, I love the dog. She's a great dog. I'm like, it's no problem. You know, not at all. I'm like, I'm not mad, upset, you know, nothing like that, you know? So just those cases of those weird things that can pop up. The other thing too, I try to tell people, and we talked about this on, on one of my, my other episodes with a friend of mine that has the, the, uh, the training facility, it's understand also like what you're getting into with a dog. Like I I've got, you know, people that want pointers and I'm like, man, you better be very, you know, 
be very sure you want one or right. two pointers because they, I listen, I love my dogs to death, but they can be a real handful. And if you don't have the space and things like that, I mean, I'm, I'm preaching the choir with you, but you know, the working dogs and the sporting breed dogs need so much more stimulation, you know, than other dogs. And, uh, I think from the behavioral side as well, that could be, you could be setting yourself up for issues, you know, if you're not too sure, fully, you know, ready of what you're walking into. Right. Right. And I think that, that, you know, you bring up a good point there as far as I, I see a lot of mismatches out there, you know, here in, in, in Southeast South Dakota, pheasant hunting is kind of king. And I think a lot of people choose a pointing breed dog thinking they want that classic point, but then they, you know, just rail on the dog and, and hack them in and, and they actually want a flushing dog. Oh yeah. But they, they buy a pointing dog. And so then they get super frustrated when that short hair or that wire hair ranges out, you know, 75 to a hundred yards, which in pointing dog world is a tight, tight working dog. It, and, and they want that dog to work at their feet and they want it to point, but then they also want it to flush. And so understanding what you're actually going to ask of that dog, I think is a, is a huge thing as well that I think people overlook. The other thing too, you know, I'll see here, uh, we have a really, really active NAVDA group. And so everybody's answer is a short hair and a wire hair, you know, and it just, they don't fit for everybody. Right. And so you get that, you know, ritzy neighborhood that, that has, you know, the, the covenants that you can't have fences and suddenly it becomes problems with the neighbor's cat, the neighbor's small little white fluffy dog, because you have this <laughs> versatile dog that's, yeah. that's trained to do certain things with small furry animals and, and, and people don't think that through. Right. And so I think that that's the important thing too. And even, even in my world with the setters, you know, I hunt a lot of prairie birds. And so that big running dog that is, is good, but not necessarily horseback level, big running dogs. And so it's, it's, it's knowing what you're getting into, um, th that I think is, is, is part of that research as well. So not just from the health aspect, but, but as you said, make sure you're matching up with the hunting that you do, you're getting the dog that's right for that situation. Yeah. I mean, cause they're beautiful dogs, you know, I mean, especially like short hair, I mean, not just short hairs, but I mean, short hairs, you know, I think are a big allure to people because of the coloration that they have and, you know, their athleticism and their look and their build and, and, you know, but I'm like, they're not, they're great family dogs. Don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but they need work. <laughs> like, right. or you, like you, or like you said, you're going to start having issues and then, you know, they need the stimulation. And then with, out the stimulation they're going to find it which could cause the injuries where people are coming to see you you know whether it's god forbid hit by car you know getting right. bit by something because they're getting you know just explorative and, and things like that so you know it's like that with anything you know and you bring up a good point too about the hunting because you know with my pointers my female she i mean it's she's gone you know and you got to be able to keep up with them you know if they go locked up on point or something like that and and understand, like you said, do you want a dog working within, you know, 20 yards of you, or do you want to just let that dog be able to go? So, right. you know, there's a lot more than just going, Ooh, that dog is pretty. I want that dog. And then, you know, you could, right. you could end up resenting that dog. And then that, that, the quality of life isn't going to be there and they're not doing what they're designed to do. Okay. So let's go into now. So we, we, we did our vetting, we, well, no pun intended, there, <laughs> right? But we, uh, <laughs> we, we found our breeder. Okay. We got the puppy in hand. All right. Now we're coming to, you know, the veterinarian. And I think this is something important too, that I think people don't think about either because they're set in their ways. Maybe they had previous animals and they had their own vet. The reason why I choose the vet that I do in town, and we've got a lot of ones around us is that she actually has pointers. Like she's got experience with working dogs. She's not board certified, but she's got pointers. She's got labs. So I can go to her and ask questions in like, Hey, is this, you know, normal? So I think, you know, also with your breeder, I think you need to do a little bit of research on the veterinarians in your area as well. You know, talk to people in the area. Like if you have a local NAVDA group, like, Hey, who are you going to see? Who, who are you taking your dog to that probably gets a lot of people, you know, with the working breeds and stuff like that. So I think that's another important thing too, because you know, in my years, you know, all in undergrad and everything like that, working in vet hospitals, you know, there were, and I'm sure you've seen it, there were veterinarians that just stayed away from certain breeds and, and things like that and just kind of had their own little niche, you know, and then, you know, something would come in and they just want to medicate the dog because it's too high strong and, you know, not really understanding the breed, you know, type of thing. So right. I and think that... I, yeah, the flip side ahead. of that, I'd say too, is that not every veterinarian that has hunting dogs or hunts 
is a good hunting dog veterinarian. And, and, yeah. and I think that that's something to, to think about too, you know, and, and then when you're asking your buddies for advice, you know, there, there's certain dog groups where <clears throat> the dog's a tool and, and people seek out cheap veterinary care as opposed to quality veterinary care. And so it's, it's, it's understanding what you're looking for, just like with the breeder and with the dog, you know, a lot of people think that, well, we all went to vet school, you know, maybe we hunt. So we all, and, and it's not, it's, there's a lot of differences you can have six veterinary clinics in one town and, and not one of them is similar to the other. And so to your point, doing your research, but it's not every case that a, dog, a, a vet that hunts is going to be knowledgeable about hunting dogs, which blows my mind. I, I always thought it would be just like uh, you hunt, given. you're a veterinarian, you think you'd you know really yeah. love these sporting dogs, but it's, it's for some reason it is not the case. Okay. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and, and I've seen it too. So, um, Okay, so let's kind of move into and again for people listening, you know, um, you know, Joe is kind of on a time frame for or time restriction for today, so we're gonna make this like a uh, you know film this on a different day too. So because this is a topic that you know I know he's passionate about, and we were talking you know off air to get a, a really good episode with this because there's a lot of things to cover. Um, so we're gonna kind of move a little bit slowly here in this this first episode, um, but now that we got the puppy. Okay, now we're we're starting cons- we're bringing them to you as the veterinarian. Now let's talk about the wellness side of things. Mm-hmm. Okay, what can people expect? What are the questions that they should be asking their veterinarian, considering that now they have entered into the world of a working breed, you know, sporting breed dog. You know, as far as to give you an example, um, you know, with with my vet, um, you know, besides like the five and one and things like that, you know, getting a lime added to that or, you know, just the little considerations that nuances that maybe people don't think about or read up on um, to consider as they go into their veterinarian to uh, take that puppy. Sure. So it's it, it, this obviously, you know, coming in for a first puppy visit is probably over an hour long talk you know with me and so the the first thing i would say probably the most important thing that we do with these young active sporting dogs is feeding a large breed puppy or large breed growth formula um, in measured amounts and so it's one of those things that it's it's those formulas and they really should be rebranded and so they're not just for large breeds it's it's for active dogs so even you know my 25 pound cockers 35 pound setters I'm still feeding those restricted formulas and where a lot of uh, confusion comes is a lot of people think that, that you're going to end up with a smaller dog and that's not the case. It's slower growth to get to what they're genetically programmed to be. And they're, they're lower in calcium and vitamin D. So those bones and joints are laid down correctly. The big thing is, if you think about it, that first year to two years of life, we're building the athlete that you're going to have for the next decade. And if you screw that up, and, and, and overbuild it, you get a dog too heavy, you have a dog with joint problems, there's no unwinding that years down the road. And so that first year of feeding is far and away the most important thing we do because it's setting the stage for the entire rest of that dog's life. And so controlled feedings, measured amounts of a large breed puppy, uh, our growth formula are super important uh, in, in number one on my list. So what uh, is, so what separates a large breed, just for the listeners yep. out there, so what separates the large breed formulas versus like a performance, you know, formula. So the, the performance formula is like the other end of the spectrum. And so with the, with the performance formula, high fat, high protein. Um, and so with that, you're going to have a high calcium, high vitamin D, particularly if it's animal sourced. And so with the large breed growth formulas, we want lower calcium, lower vitamin D. And, and the other part of that is, is that we need quality proteins. And so it's that balance of being able to give them the, the building blocks to build that body, but not over give some of the micronutrients. And that's why they're specifically formulated. And so for a long time that, you know, and you still find breeders, I still get people that come in in a breeders recommending um, either one feeding the adult formula instead of the performance or and instead of a puppy formula or doing in all life stages. And, and to me that, that like, there's nothing worse, right? Like it's, it's just because a formula says all life stages, all that means is it's not going to kill your dog of any life stage, but it's not optimized for that life stage. And when we're talking about athletes, we're trying to optimize things. And so those large breed growth or puppy formulas are optimized to slow that growth rate down. And so it's not stunt that growth rate, but it's, it's to get that dog where it's genetically programmed. And the example I'd give is, you know, we all see that 120 pound lab that's, you know, he's ripped. He looks 
athletic, but a lab's not meant to be 120 pounds. And so it's, it's, if you throw fuel on that fire, you might not have a dog that gets obese, but you're gonna have a dog that's bigger than it should be. And, and that's what we're trying to avoid with these large breed growth um, or large breed puppy formulas. And so they're completely formulated different for slow, but good quality growth in these athletic dogs. Yeah, I think that I, I didn't want to get into the food thing this early, but it makes sense. You got to understand <laughs> what to get into. Right. With the puppy, and, and, and it's number one. And, and listen, we could, and I, I'm preaching the choir here, we could do two four hour episodes on dog food. Okay. Right. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, people, it just, it's one of those confusing things because, you know, um, you know, you look at, you know, let's say pro plan or something, for instance, and, and, you know, I've got pointers. So you see a German short hair pointer, you know, on the bag, you know, and a performance blend and stuff like that. And it, it's confusing for people. I know, you know, it's, it, it, it was for me, you know, my wife got crazy with me, you know, kind of going down the rabbit hole, if you will, with dog foods and stuff. But yeah, I never realized the whole, the whole large breed formula, you know, I, I feed, you know, my pointers, Victor performance. Um, you know, I don't know what, sorry, I'm all tangled up in these cords here. Um, but I don't know what, you know, foods or food, you know, there's, there's good foods for, but for me, my dogs just seem to do so good on that food, you know, and it was one of those to where, you know, it just is a performance blend. And I just, I, I, in my head, I'm like, I want the performance blend. I've got this high octane dog, you know, and, and I didn't realize the formulas for the, the large breed were like that. So I yeah, think, and, and you know, one thing I'll say on the performance. So, <clears throat> unfortunately too many people have that idea right you have a high octane yeah. dog so you need that in most of the performance formulas most hunting dogs don't need the performance formulas and so where those formulas were developed for dogs working multiple days and so my breakdown is a dog that has heavy activity probably more than four days a week and and so you know like in my world it's dogs you know working on guiding operations you know oftentimes either retired people or or we have a number of firemen you know where they have a number of shifts on but then a number of shifts off and they're really able to go out and hammer it um, most of the retrieving breeds aren't working hard enough that they need the performance formula um, you know particularly you, you get a guy you know is, is he's duck hunting by himself you know that dog's making maybe six retrieves you know, and then, and then sitting back at home in a, in a uh, house with a furnace, it's, it's really understanding because at the flip side of it, I see a lot of obese hunting dogs and people will come in and be like, oh, that's a great, you know, pheasant hunting dog. And, and the dog is 30 pounds overweight. And all I see is, is potential for, for blown cruciates. And so really knowing, and again, to your point that we could have multiple episodes, I think people make that assumption. You see a pointer on the bag or you see a lab on the bag. And so I got to have that high octane most dogs don't require the high octane and we're just going to lead them down a path of obesity, uh, which I think is, is unfortunate. And so it's, it's, it's one that the, the companies have kind of sold us that without the education that should have come with it. And so those for, those, those, uh, performance formulas are for specific, um, a specific class of endurance athletes, basically, and, and not all of our hunting dogs fit in that. And, and weekend warrior dogs don't either. You know, I think that dog that hunts super hard on a two or three days of the weekend, oftentimes they're fine on their maintenance food, just to increase amounts. And, and I think that's the other part that gets missed with people. Dog food isn't, you know, I feed this amount all year long. It, it should look like this, particularly as we start talking uh, premium. The other thing I'll mention too, um, when you bring up, you brought up a couple different companies, is understanding what you're feeding. And so again, you'd, you'd mentioned off air about being on the Facebook groups and, and things like that. And there's a lot of keyboard experts that don't really know oh, what yeah. they're talking about. And, and there's a lot of pros out there that, you know, they're switching brands or, are going with products based on who's paying them or who's giving them free food. And, and so yeah. understanding what those manufacturers are doing. And so there are some companies that have, you know, been in the dog food business and that is all they do. And they're, they're, they're making products to make dogs live a long time. And then there's other companies that are large animal feed companies that then decided to dabble in to dog food, or they need to, to streamline their equipment, right? They have all this equipment. There's not as much demand in the large animal feed world. And so then they start, you know, manufacturing dog foods. And so they can, they can make their products look slick but dogs probably aren't their first um, first love for that or where they, they start. Yeah. So understanding that too about about some of these smaller companies that seem like they're gonna you know take off in the hunting dog world, oftentimes they're a Johnny come lately. And, and understanding how did they formulate their formulas, 
what is the background of the company? Um, and then two, and three is is asking who's manufacturing that that formula. You know, companies like Perina, companies like Yukonuba, they control it from start to finish. A lot of these other companies aren't able to say that. Yeah, and I and I think I have I just pulled up this website. So I listened. There was I was on YouTube and I listened to a video one time with a board certified veterinary nutritionist um, that came on the show and they were talking about dog foods. And I think is it Pet Nutrition Alliance? Are you familiar with that website? Uh, I'm not. Um, I think it I think this is it. I don't have time to dig into everything. But basically, there is a, an organization like them. And I think this is it. I don't want to spend the time to, to dig on on that. But for people out there, there is a website to where it's an alliance, like a nonprofit type of thing, to where exactly what you said, they submit, they, they go to these dog food companies and say, okay, what's your source of animal protein? What's your quality control measures? Do you have a board certified veterinary nutritionist on staff? You know, what's your quality control measures? Do you use third party, you know, nutritionists like, you know, so there and I went down there and looked at and there was a lot of really good information on there. And I think that's a, an industry in itself on rating dog foods, like you said, but that I remember listening to that episode and her breaking it down and, and looking at that information to say, hey, you know, like you said, this company controls it from the beginning until the end. And there's, you know, board certified veterinary nutritionists on staff that are in the process the whole way. So, and it might not be the big name brand food that you're, you know, used to seeing on the shelves, you know, something like that. So there's information out there for people, um, you know, rather than just Googling, which can be good, but it can also be a trap as well, Sure, you know, type of thing. So um, I would ask too, so you brought up um, as far as feeding food, it should not be a, a one food throughout the entire year. And I'm thinking selfishly here, you know, so would it make more sense? Cause my dogs are definitely the weekend warriors. I mean, my right. dogs, you know, I mean, they're with me, they're outside, they're running around like the a-holes that they are <laughs> people call them. Right. But to your point, they're not overexerting themselves. So would it make more sense for someone that's maybe been, been, you know, chron chronically, you know, feeding a performance blend to switch over to a large breed? or continue like what what's the so, kind of path there yeah. for people that have a two or three year old like i do right so just one clarification so the large breed puppy formulas are important for, oh, the, for the puppy okay for for large breed puppies <clears throat> not necessarily for active hunting dogs so the large breed active hunting dogs um you, you probably don't want to go with like a large breed adult so the large breed adults okay. are for all intents and purposes diet foods and so they're okay. not there's not anything magical other than they're they're lower in calories because again <clears throat> you know, most of these hunting breed dogs are also our popular pet breed dogs. And so you get these large breed dogs that aren't doing anything and they need to be on a diet food, but most people don't want to put, say that their dogs on a low fat food. So then we just put them on a large breed food. So with most hunting dogs that are weekend warriors are during the hunting season, most of the adult formulas from, you know, that, that 2618 type of blend that, that, you know, all these companies have is going to be adequate. And, and so it's not necessarily even about switching products throughout the year. It's about switching amounts based on activity. And so there's times, you know, that, that we go through the, the dead of summer when the dogs just go out to go to the bathroom, come in, cause it's just too hot to do anything. Yeah. I feel like I'm, you know, I mean, they're getting a minimal amount versus, you know, I go out West and, in and, and, you know, they're putting on 20 miles a day, um, three, four days in a row. I can't get them enough nutrition. They, they physically won't eat enough and they'll come back looking like they lost weight. And so it's more about the amount as opposed to necessarily switching types. Okay. But I think, I think the big thing too is, is, is just making sure you're not having an obese dog and in, in that you're not cutting them too short like if you're feeding the performance formula and you're really having to scale back the amounts and you get too far away from the bag recommendations then what you worry about is that you're probably cheating that dog from some of the micronutrients and that's where stepping down a formula where you can feed them adequate amounts of a, of a less hot formula in order to get those micronutrients that they need as well okay i mean we're, we're on the subject of food so we might as well it's going good so we'll just keep going down this so like i said the next one we can move into the actual wellness if we if sure. we have time we can touch a little bit on it um so let's talk about the devil in the room the raw diet and, and the freeze dried you know i mean because I, i'll tell you you know and, and maybe you'll yell at me <laughs> you know but what i try to do with my dogs is you know at least once a week you know like i just it's deer season here you know so 
in the past when it's not deer season or something like that, you know, what I'll do is, you know, I've got a, a cow liver, you know, in my truck or not in my truck in uh, my freezer. <laughs> And, uh, you know, my sister's got a little farm with duck eggs and stuff like that, that no one really eats the duck eggs. So eggs, so I take them, I don't have a problem with them, but maybe like once or twice a week, you know, I'll, I'll give my dogs, you know, I'll, I'll thaw out a piece of liver, you know, and, and cube it up, you know, with, with eggs and stuff like that. And, and kind of give them some, maybe it's doing something. I don't know. They seem to enjoy it, but I know there's a lot of people that live or die by the, by the raw diet, you know, type of thing. So sure from the veterinary say, and, and again, like to your point earlier, I mean, you, you see some veterinarians that, you know, are, are live or live or die by it, you know, and then some are like, well, let's pump the brakes here a little bit. So, you know, let's go down that path, I guess. Yeah. So it, honestly, I think at the end of the day, like, so I used to, when I was younger, I'd be more passionate about telling people I thought they were dumb, that that's what they were feeding. Uh, I'm a little more diplomatic with age in, in that if, if that's her choice, you know, uh, the thing I would ask is how was it formulated? Um, I, I work with a number of board certified nutritionists and what I ask clients is if you're going to go that route at a minimum, let's run your formula by a board certified nutritionist to make sure that it's indeed balanced. Because I think what happens is a lot of people default to what's easy and what their dog will eat. And that's where those things fall out of balance. I will also tell you that in 20 plus years of doing this, I don't think I have a single client that's done it long term. And so that's the other reason that instead of me going in saying you're dumb for doing this and here are the, you know, all of the reasons why it's dumb, I take the different approach and say, okay, I'm just going to help you do it better if that's what you want to choose. And, and oftentimes they'll self select out, right? Like it's a pain in the butt. Most dogs don't do well on it long term. Um, and, and so I don't necessarily fight the battle. I provide the education, right? And so yeah. at the end of the day, it's a, it's a real food safety issue. And so you're, you're dealing with raw meats. You, you, your dog is excreting bacteria that's on those raw meats. And so particularly if there's kids involved, uh, you know, females reproductive age, if they have, you know, older people involved that immunocompromised people with cancer, there's a real risk that you're putting people in by feeding those raw products. Um, and so it's, it's one that in the science is there, um, to show that I think too, you know, people that do a lot of the bone stuff, we'll see dental fractures and, and there's just a host of issues that come with feeding that way. Um, and so we can provide the information. It really doesn't make sense from a science standpoint. There's these health risks that are involved um, and it's a pain in the butt, but if you want to go that route, let's just make sure we're doing it right. Um, from like the, the supplementation standpoint, honestly, you know, my opinion is it's probably more for you than it is for yeah. your dogs. And so you're not, you're not, you know, they're not, getting some superpower from that liver once or twice a week. Um, it's a treat. And, and, and that's how I that's, view that's it. That's the way I look at and, it. Is you know, it's more of a treat. For and, and so the big thing I'd say there is, is just food handling. Right. And so making sure that, um, you know, like if you're feeding beef liver, is it, you know, is your sister's farm, is it grass fed where we know that that grass fed animals don't have as many E. coli problems as we do with grain finished and changing the GI tract. Um, you know, with the eggs, same sort of thing. I think you're just, it, it's, it's a placebo effect for yeah. the owner, which I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but at the end yeah. of the day, um, I will say that, uh, if, if you have anybody in the family that does any baking, the duck eggs are uh, they, they, yeah, that's phenomenal why we in, yeah. in the, in the, in the baking stuff. So, um, it, it's one that, that, you know, I think there's a lot of, and you mentioned veterinarians, right. And so I think it's, it's, it's one that, um, any profession out there, you have people that march to a beat of their own drummer. It doesn't mean that they're right, that, that you know, they, they can have a very highly educated background and then essentially choose to in, ignore that education with, with how they practice. And, and that's where um, I'm very Western, very evidence-based. Uh, yeah. and, and, and what makes it tough in, in the sports medicine world, in the rehab world, in veterinary medicines, we don't have a lot of that evidence that exists in the literature yet. And so it's a little bit of the wild west. And so we rely on human literature to kind of, to, 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 to shape how we do things in the sports medicine world. And so, you know, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's hypocritical, but I, I feel that way sometimes when I chastise people that, that don't follow the evidence that out is out there. And then I'm in a specialty that doesn't have a lot of evidence yet. Yeah. It's, I, I've told people that before too, cause they've asked my opinion on it. I'm like, well, you know, I'm not an expert, but I said, you know, along the lines of what you did as well, 
you know, again, I, I've watched that particular, you know, video with that uh, veterinary nutritionist. She's got multiple videos. I can't think who it is. Um, but she was talking about the whole, it obviously came up about the raw diet. Mm -hmm. And just like you said, it's like the handling thing, because a lot of people don't realize that, you know, they hear a veterinarian, you know, like yourselves, you know, and others, you know, talk about the negative effects or kind of the lack of effect of a raw diet. And they think, you know, just some shill for a dog food company, like you're getting some right. big kickback or something. But what people don't realize is the role that veterinarians play in public health, you know, and you know, you talked about food handling and things like that. And, and I remember her talking about that was, you know, if you have your own farm, like you said, and you can control the meat source and you know, the temperatures of your freezers and you know, this and know this and know this, and you work alongside with a veterinary nutritionist to, like you said, run the blend by, is this going to work then, you know, why not, right. you know, and if it's something that you have access to and you want to do for that dog's life. Okay. You know, again, being under, or excuse me, being informed and working with people that are board certified and understand what your dog needs whether it's going to someone like you who's a board certified you know sporting in, uh, breed alongside with a nutritionist it can be done yeah you know type of thing but i i see it all the time again on these facebook pages and stuff where people are talking about it. i'm just like okay do you know what the setting was on that freezer in the grocery store when you were in there how many times is that you know, piece of meat changed hands, okay. you know, how long are you, I mean, just from the handling standpoint, there's a lot of things, like you said, that can go wrong. And, you know, the literature out there, like you said, too, there's, there's plenty of literature out there to, to show things, but people, if you tell them to go on to, you know, Google scholar or whatever, to right. go through and dive bold or you know, <laughs> dig through that, they're not going to do it. Absolutely not. <laughs> you, you, they're not, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I don't fault them for that either, you know, and there's people that I see on there that are just looking for information and then right. the keyboard, you know, people throw out information and they look at their profile page and like this person's been breeding dogs for 30 years, you know, type right. of thing. So, you know, it's just, a, it's just one of those things I think it needs to keep getting brought up talking with guys like yourself because there's a lot of misinformation out there and there's a lot of overwhelming information out there when it comes to dog foods right you know because like you say it's a marketing thing there, there's all this stuff getting pushed on on the consumers like myself you know the bags that got a pointer the bags that got a lab and, and you're like that looks like a good food i know people are talking about this food and it's just confusing <laughs> oh yeah and, and i and i and i tell people you know so i've worked in the industry i've worked for a number of the companies and, and have friends that work for all of them and i still feel it's uh, unintentionally the most deceptive industry in veterinary yeah. medicine you know i think people have their hearts are in good places i think that you know even some of these small companies that that have a purely marketing product I think that that a lot of those people that develop that, even though the science isn't there, their heart was in the right place and they genuinely yeah. believe in what they're going in. And that's where I think it's separating that. Right. And that's I think over the years what I found, like on the raw side, why I'm not as combative, but just more present the facts, ask people to consult with nutritionists is that I've been shocked where. It, it, it is people that were just looking for information, right? And they happen to go down a wrong path and you give them this information like, oh crap, I didn't know that. And they change their ways versus you have people that just need to be contrary and you don't know until you have that conversation and, and start that education process. And so it, it, it's, whether it's raw or whether it's commercial, I think it's, it's, it's a very difficult industry to decipher and to understand. And, and every time I step out of it from a consulting world, you know, there'll be three or four companies that come up that I have to contact people I know in the industry and say, okay, who's making it, you know, where's it yeah. made, what's the story? Because it, it's difficult to find, even trying to find that information sometimes, uh, again, because there's so many layers to it that, that understanding it can be very difficult, particularly for just an average consumer. Yeah, they, uh, yeah, for sure. It's, it's, <laughs> it's just, it's one of those topics. Like I said, I mean, we, we could go down forever. Um, <laughs> one last thing on there. So what should people be looking for? So we, we mentioned a couple of times, like animal protein, like the source of it. Yep. Flipping that bag over, looking at the label. All right. What are some of the things that people should look for, for the good? And what are some things that jump out towards the top? Cause if I remember right, isn't it that the highest percentage material needs to be listed i think at the first correct and, and, and then so, down so yep. the first couple things you look at could tell you a lot about that food potentially and so okay. i think okay. so, yeah. be, and that's where so it's one 
so the bigger companies have to follow AFCO guidelines, right? And they have to use their labeling is by the books because they're going to be the ones that are going to be sued first. And so you have some of these smaller companies that can play a game and, and their labels maybe aren't as truthful. And so it is very difficult to look at the back of the bag and make some of those decisions. So like general rules of thumb good quality animal-based protein as a protein source, good quality animal-based fat as the fat source are, are kind of the big things. Um, carbohydrates get knocked a lot, but I think having a blend of carbohydrates that are aimed at maintaining blood sugar is important for hunting dogs. And so it's, it's you know, we start talking about evil ingredients, right? And so things like corn for a long time have been, you know, labeled as an evil ingredient. The problem was, is back in the day, companies, especially cheap dog food companies, would use corn and in, in do what's called ingredient splitting, where you might look at that label and there'd be whole corn, shelled corn, crushed corn, you know, corn gluten, where you'd have maybe corn listed five times. It might not have been the number one ingredient because they split that up and, and had you just the amount of corn in that formula would have been number one, but because we can split out the different sources of corn, it's no longer that first ingredient. And so what I've seen in today's world is that some of these really high end formulas will do that ingredient splitting. And so there, there's a, a product out there called like red meat formula. But if you look at the back of that bag, it'll have red lentils, lentils, crushed lentils, lentil powder, powder, peas where the legumes end up if you probably looked at that formula it's probably a legume formula but because they're able to split that out they can say red meat because red meat's listed number one and so looking to see are there ingredients further down that label that are the same but different in in in, in that it's just different forms of the same ingredient and so ingredient splitting still takes place it's just it's they're using you know stuff that traditionally wasn't used in dog foods and so they get away with it i think the other side of that is you know like uh, chicken byproduct meal if it's a highly refined good source and so there are some companies that that make sure it's good quality organ meat it can be a great bioavailable protein of very high quality <clears throat> and i think it's ironic you brought up like the freeze-dried diets right in in if you look at some of those ingredients what is it it's liver it's trachea it's it's byproducts and and people will rave and spend hundreds of dollars on that freeze-dried product but then they'll chastise a company for using it as an ingredient in in kibble dog food and so it's it's understanding what this terminology means in in what you're looking at and, and am i looking at a bag from a company like a perina yukonuba or am i looking at a small regional company because that's going to be a huge difference and so you know it's it's one i i did some work for a, a regional dog food company years ago and on the front of their bag they'd say added glucosamine and chondroitin and glucosamine and chondroitin is not an approved dog food ingredient you won't see it on major manufacturers listed as a separate ingredient. There, there was a period of time where some of the companies were paying to look into like their chicken byproduct meal and how much glucosamine chondroitin was in that so they could label it. But what would happen is these small manufacturers in, in nobody's looking at packaging except on the state level. And so you'd have a state inspector go into a dog food store, randomly pick off SKUs and, and then evaluate that. So they might get a letter that your five pound senior lists, you know, glucosamine and chondroitin. So we need you to remove that from your five pound senior packaging. Meanwhile, every other SKU had it on it, but that wasn't one of the ones they randomly selected. And so the company then says, we apologize for the mis you know, misperception or error in our ways. When packaging runs out, we will change that. Everybody goes about their business, packaging never runs out, and those small companies are able to continue under the radar. And so it's, it's, it's again, looking at a back of a bag is, is, is very difficult. Like we said, it's, it's kind of that deceptive nature. Of what am I looking at? And so then it's digging that layer deeper. You know, is it quality protein? Is it quality fat? And then what do I know about the manufacturer? How long have they been in the dog food game? What's the research that they're doing? How are they trying to better their product? Um, you know, and then, and then digging a little bit deeper into those products. Okay. Yeah. Um, we'll, one more, th we'll touch on one more thing. And okay. then I know we're, we're kind of getting close here and then we can phase into the next sure. part of it on the next episode, but DCM, you know, uh, dilated cardiomyopathy yep. is, is another one that gets brought up a lot, especially with, you mentioned the peas and the legumes and things yep. like that. So, you know, how common is that? You know, I mean, it, for people listening, I mean, is it really, 
it's a thing. Like it's not. It's that's not a. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I didn't want to make it sound like it's not a thing. It just like you you see it get thrown around so often. Yep. What's the what's the and, and so, yeah. so my, my, we talked about my wife. So she does a lot of cardiology and, and, and performs a lot of echoes, um, particularly here, you know, a couple of years ago when it, when it became known, she was seeing a lot of dogs that the only abnormality they had was feeding a grain free dog food. <clears throat> I, I don't think we know enough about the, you know, exactly what's going on to say every grain free is evil. I think what's interesting is that, you know, obviously even some of the major manufacturers have grain free products. And we really didn't see the problem in in those products. And so it goes back to, you know, are there formulations, are there mineral selections, you know, the fact that they have those those um, experts involved, for some reason, their formulas weren't producing these DCM issues. Uh, it was the small boutique brands or or the the even the bigger regional companies um, that maybe didn't have those same scientists on board with their development. And so where we were seeing it was in the novel ingredients. And so a lot of these products that were trying to promote themselves as grain free, but were using, they're still using carbohydrates. And I think that's the big misconception is people think that a grain free diet is just a meat diet. And that's not the case. They're still using carbohydrates. They're just using novel sources like the peas, like the lentils. Uh, and, and we were seeing dogs that would have dilated cardiomyopathy as a result of that. Um, and so it's, it's a real world thing. I don't think we know enough to say this is exactly why it was a, a thing. And these are the products. Um, my point of kind of point of reference is, is Tufts Nutrition Service has an awesome site. And, and I feel like they've been on the cutting edge or the leading edge of, of not just, um, uh, the research, but then also the, the communication. So they have a lot of, um, articles on their site for, for lay people of like, here's what we know, here's what we don't know. Uh, it's a great, great resource on this very subject. Okay. Yeah. And while you were talking to, for people listening, um, I did, I did look at this, this is the website. So it, the website's called pet nutrition Alliance.org. Um, and you can go in there to the manufacturer reports and I'm not going to list any, any brand names or anything here, but they break it down by brand name. They break it down by, does that brand contract out the manufacturing of their dog food? Yes or no. You know, do they have on staff, you know, a board certified nutritionist? Some of them said, you know, consult with a nutritionist with a PhD in animal nutrition, you know, some employ, you know, fully, you know, board certified veterinary nutritionists you know, manufacturing plants, they own 100% of the information. Um, and that so I mean, you can go through here. And if right. you want to dig through, you know, they have all I mean, there's over 15 pages of different dog foods, right. you know, on here. So, you know, I think that's a good resource for people um, to go on there. Now, I will say, um, some of them, you know, this is all predicated on when they send out the, the, the questionnaire to these companies that they send it back. Sure. So some of them are not going to, they're going to be listed on here that they did not respond, you know, whether that's a good thing or bad thing, right. yeah, I, you know, tis their own, I guess. Um, but this is a good resource. I found this resource interesting. Um, when I heard that, that, uh, that veterinary nutritionist talk about it and, you know, I, I, uh, yeah, I'm glad I found that because I think that's a good thing for people to look at too, if you want to dig through it. Um, so, okay, we'll uh, take a break. We'll wrap this up okay. and then we'll pick this up, you know, here and uh, next time and we'll Sounds keep this good. going. All right. And that's a wrap on another episode of the Hunt Science Podcast. I want to thoroughly take this time to thank everybody who has listened or even watched till the end of this episode and, and had the opportunity to uh, hopefully enjoy the show that we put out for you. It's something that we're really trying to do and take notes and uh, you know put good quality content for everybody to enjoy. We want to take this moment also to, if you enjoyed the show, check us out over on our social media platforms. Give us a like, give us a follow, check that bell notification, look for the content that we're putting out. Of course, reach out to us, leave comments. Did you like the show? We would love to hear uh, your reviews of the show and any concerns that you have, any any uh, updates or any type of uh, uh, feedback to make our, our content better. We're always uh, open ears for the people that are consuming our show and our content. We want to hear from you. What is it that you want to see and what is it that you would like us to do? If you want to check us out on any of our social media, first off, you can head over to our website, go to www.huntsciencepodcast.com. 
You can check us out on Instagram at hunt science underscore podcast, or you can check us out over at our Facebook page at the hunt science podcast. Any of those is, is open. You can, like I said, feel free to comment and, and all the above that you do with social media. I just want to take this time again to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for everybody for watching and listening to the content that we're putting out. It means the world to me, and I can't wait for you guys to join us on another episode. Until then, everybody, have a great day, and we'll see you next time.